Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for coming and joining me here in my shop right next to Lake Kuchiching in Ontario, Canada. Today is August 21st and you might hear a little bit of a lift in my voice. Last video ended with me basically scratching the remnants of the hair out of the top of my head. And what is going on with this machine here? What's it doing with all this circuitry here? What is happening with this extra tube? I did research looking for the answer to that question. I couldn't find any information anywhere about it. Uh, no Heathkit information anyway. So I reverted to just, I don't know what to do. So I started looking through the information that came with this unit. A friend of mine gave me this without too much comment quite a few years ago. A long time ago. 20, 20 years ago. Inside the manual were a bunch of uh, articles that have been cut out of magazines way back when. Markers and alignment bugs and stuff like that. One of these papers, this one, marker adder for your sweep generator. That's my sweep generator sitting there. And look, right away you can glance at the circuit and see a 6AU6 sitting here. The fact is that whoever owned this got this magazine, saw this article, and built this circuit and stuck it in this machine. That's what's happened. So it's certainly in the realm of a big modification to this unit. This particular panel, the, the owner, like the guy who wrote this article and developed this circuit, and this is his machine, and he's added to his machine a bias output, a bias bypass cab, a bias potentiometer for a bias circuit that he describes here. But I don't think the guy who worked on this one bothered with this circuit. It's just a completely additional thing so your unit has a variable bias output you can use. It doesn't actually, it could be in any can, it doesn't have to be inside this can. So he didn't do this. So this is what he did. Well, who knows what he did. I mean, he, he may have followed this 90% and if, if a guy is smart enough to do this, there's no plan for this other than this schematic. So the layout of the components and the parts here is something somebody has to think up ahead of time, plan out, and then execute. The, uh, it's hard to tell, but in this article, the, uh, the author shows most of the circuit changes down in this area, which would be down in this area. Here, that's what it looks like. But, in fact, most of the circuit is up in here. So whoever did this thought their way through this enough to do this. I'm really impressed. I mean, really, This is really impressive to me. Like anybody my age who's been into electronics for a long time, you've seen a lot of these old magazines, when saw them when they weren't old, and in them is always these suggested circuits that you could do. And I always scratch my head and wonder, who actually make, makes these things? I mean, this is no small deal to put this together and make it work, too. I mean, that's the last part. <laughs> i got to make it work. Um, high risk doing this. A lot of work, like in here, is drilling holes, mounting a, a uh, component there, and a component, mount, mounting the uh, socket there. I mean, there's just a lot here. So my hat's off. Yeah, I have a hat on here today. My hat's off back on again to that guy whoever that guy is now this leaves me with a tremendous problem look here's the parts list he rewrote and he's checking them off this part list matches the part list in this article here he's got the prices here $1.50 for a 6AU6 and the socket actually the total cost Seven dollars and forty-eight cents. Oh, he's got some. I knows these. So this was this was no ordinary person doing this. This was either you know an advanced ham radio guy or a serious repair technician, maybe in a professional shop. I have no idea. But whoever did it looks like they did a super good job on it. That's what it looks like. Now, the real question is, what am I going to do? So this circuit, as I understand from reading this, 
literally sits after everything else. You, you don't have to, you wouldn't have to build this inside here. You could build it in its own box. It actually doesn't do much with what this unit actually does. It, as he calls it, he calls it a marker adder. So as I read in this article, interestingly enough, I'm learning little bits and pieces here. In most of these kinds of devices, the signals come out a single terminal, go to the antenna of the radio you're going to test, and then all the signals, sweep signal, marker signals, whatever it might be, are passing through the entire receiver and then being picked up probably at the detector to, to ref be reflected on the oscilloscope. In this case, what he's done is he has a way for the marker signals to be delivered outside of the receiver under test. This isn't the receiver under test, but outside of the receiver under test. So the, the marker signals do not pass through the receiver you're testing. They go straight to your scope input. And uh, the and then s somehow obviously this has to be coordinated with the uh, with the test signal itself. So I think you're taking the test signal. Yeah, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I still don't know yet what is going on here exactly. So the idea here is you get two big benefits from doing this. And it's kind of revealed in this diagram here. In many cases, a device like this can produce the main the main signal, which would produce a main trace like this, and one pip. Pip is the word they use for these little marks you see. And this is coming from the other signal generator that's built in here. That you can then uh, mark, if you like, where these frequencies occur on this curve. It's very tricky to figure out the exact frequency of this curve. But if you can plant onto the curve a mark of a known frequency, then you know that at that point, that frequency is occurring. That's what that would be. So the idea of this device is you get much, much better marks. When you do this, uh, I've done this a few times. Uh, you just use two, two signal generators and uh, a sweep and, uh, and a single frequency generator. And you can get a pip like that, but it's much wider and messier. You can still figure out where the center is. Uh, of it and stuff like that, but it's not a nice, neat, sharp pip. And I guess that's what he's trying to show here. Our nice, neat, sharp pips. Yeah. And of course, you know, this device and the real challenge in doing alignments is not with radios or FM radios. It's with television sets. Um, that's where that's where the real rubber meets the uh, road. You're going to align a television set, there's an awful lot of stuff that has to occur in different kinds of circuits in that. And so you'd need something like this to pull it off. Okay, so what we got here is a signal generator with an additional circuit, kind of added right at the output, sort of, you can look at it that way. Uh, so the bulk of the device should be working in the way that it was intended to work, and this additional circuit just adds more stuff to it. Now, some changes have been made internally with how it works, uh, contrary to what I just said. <laughs> works the same, but these terminal sockets have been changed. So we see a wire coming back here, coming into the adder circuit. We'll just call this the adder circuit. Uh, by the way, how do you get how do you get so many pips? Pip, 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 pip. How do you get so many pips when you've only got one one crystal? That's the crystal socket there. You plug a crystal in. Just one crystal. Uh, this is done by beating the crystal frequency against the frequency of the sweep. And uh, beating um, not, not just the frequency, not just the frequency of the uh, of the crystal, but the multiple harmonics that are going to come from the crystal oscillator circuit, as I understand it. So for instance, you pop in here a crystal at 4.5 megahertz every pip you get will be 4.5 megahertz separated then if you can calibrate your uh, frequency that your uh, the, the center frequency or main frequency uh, uh, set it to where you want it then you know the pips are exactly 4.5 megahertz away from it all the time they're they're 4.5 and uh, 
this is a, a, a great help, I guess. You know, this is a world where there were no uh, frequency counters. So without a frequency counter, it's really hard to know what frequency you're on for sure. You get more and more equipment in here to try to figure it out. Bring a radio in, tune it in, but is the radio accurate? It's, it's really, really tricky. These things here, big revolution, big revolution. And I'm yapping away here because I'm trying, I'm actually trying to decide what to do. What are my options? So my options are, we'll just walk away from this and put it aside, go back to aligning the FM radio that's here and use this piece of equipment here to do it and just forget about this for some other day. On the other hand, if I can bring this thing into functioning the way it's supposed to function, it will be helpful with not only the radio I'm looking at uh, doing, but also I have a bunch of other FM radios that are waiting to come in here and get straightened out. And it's all about alignment with them, I'm pretty sure. So, so there's a lots of impetus here to invest in working, working through everything here. Now, how do I know that this even ever worked? The guy may have done all this. It never worked. He just put it aside in terrible frustration, had a heart attack, died. My friend got it. He gave it to me, and now I got it. How do we even know it works at all? I'm so lucky to have found this circuit diagram. How do we know he followed this circuit diagram exactly as it is? Well, he could have done his own thing here. If he's smart enough to do this, he's smart enough to vary from this plan. So there, there is, there is a let's call it the native outputs from this still exist, and they may be fed into this circuit and then coming out of this circuit. But I should be able to find the native output signals from this unit, regardless of what this is doing. And because we have no pictorial diagram of this, um, I will have to just relate the schematic to these components here, it might be wise for me to draw a diagram out. Depends how far I want to go with this. Um, boy, oh boy. And then up in the back of it, oddly enough, is a... that that capacitor I think is the wrong vintage for this machine. Um, what's that tell you? Does that, that tell... Is that, a, is that a capacitor there? It looks like, looks like one. A little, little capacitor. Well, it tells you that this may have been done long after this thing was built. So this was, this was built in the early 60s. And this may have been done 15 years later. That would make it 1975 and these little parts were around for sure. Oh my my, now there are some other changes in here that are specified. Um, on a diagram. Here it is. So the, in this diagram is the removal diagram. They're showing what to remove. So the dotted lines get removed. So you see there's a dotted line with a hundred picofarad removed. And down here, this little piece here, removed. And so this is, I think, where they're fetching the output. I don't know for sure. I'd have to study this more. There's the uh, showing the crystals. The, this is the germane, this is the circuit that's in here. Uh, this is not an additional circuit by any means, but he's made small changes to it. He's showing multiple crystals. What he did on his unit is he put a switch in and he can switch through the crystals. Depending upon what kind of alignment you're doing, you're doing a video IF, uh, audio IF, or other circuits in a television set. You can select a particular crystal, which will give you, instead of the 4.5, it give you a different, a different uh, separation. I have to start doing. A, and there, in a television set, there's quite a number of traps, also. And part of the difficulty in doing an alignment is having your alignment signal trapped uh, at some point when you don't want it trapped, trapped away, and diminished. So. Uh, Okay, that's pretty good. Oh, and then this this component here has also been added. 
why this? What is this? This is a great big I'm going to take a wild guess that that's a separate transformer just to produce the heater voltage for the additional tube. That instead of just relying on the uh, heaters, see they couldn't show the heater here. The assumption is you would just you would just tack it on with the rest of the heaters and uh, you know draw a little more current out of the power supply transformer. But perhaps what this guy did was he put in another. This is definitely him putting this in. This is the loose terminal here. He's picking it. Yeah, it looks like it's coming right off the power, right off the 120 volts here. So it looks looks like that's what he did. He's, he located it here because uh, that's a good spot to put it. Oh my gosh, now what else can I get out of this before I... Uh, Says uh, to receiver detector. It kind of should say from receiver detector, shouldn't it? To receiver detector. Uh, maybe they changed these terminals uh, from what they were. Adder output to scope here. So, so this is the normal output that you would connect to your oscilloscope anyway. And I, I have it connected here with this red wire from down here. This is this is far away from the uh, from the circuit. This isn't. There's another output here. This is the RF. This is the regular RF output. So the RF pad is behind this metal plate. The input would appear to come from here. This is the attenuator control. So we have an input into here on this big resistor. This big 330, 3000 ohm, great big resistor here. Twenty two K one watt. No, that's two hundred volts. I'm in the wrong spot here. I'm I'm over on the output side of it. Input from sweep. Yeah, I'd I'm gonna have to study this a lot more on my own. I'm not gonna this will this will drive you crazy if I sit here and try to quietly sort it out. What I have to do, I have to decide what I want to do um, with my time here. Is it good to invest time in here? You know, I've invested an awful lot of time getting stuff in my head to this point. It's a shame to walk away. Because goodness knows in a month uh, what was in my head right now won't be in there anymore. I should go to the next step in trying to get some value out of this without, uh, without, uh, without what? Without, what's this? Well, it's probably the remnants of the sleeve of the guy who did the work on here. He probably caught his sleeve, a bit of his, bit of his sweater or something. Um, could also operate the unit, poke around in here. Remember, there's no output coming from it at all. Find the output coming out of the its native oscillator. Um, find out where it is in here. See it. Maybe dump this whole thing. It's generating additional markers. It's generating them to be supplied uh, directly to the scope and not through the RF output here. But the normal marker is going through this. Not this. This. Yeah, time to think a bit more. Sorry for all the talk. No action. But uh, yeah, now it's time to think. 
Well, I think if I understand fully what has been done to this unit, then I have a better chance of making sensible decisions about what I should do with it. So here are some marks that were put on this uh, uh, circuit diagram or schematic by someone, assumably the guy who built the circuit that's in there. Um, and so what, what maybe he's done is he's trying to correct the schematic so it reflects what's really inside there so someone like me <laughs> can figure it out. Um, so let's take a look at what's going on here. So here's the output attenuator. That's that's this that, that's this guy up in here with all these resistors behind the switch. So the attenuator is right on the output. This must be the RF output here. So this would be the output from the oscillator, the sweep oscillator. See that this tube is somehow involved with this, a very unusual uh, transformer. I, be I believe this is the sweep transformer. So I think I mentioned earlier how how uh, that there's a, a something a little unusual inside this in order to enable a very large sweep range. Uh, that's this thing over here. Won't get into that now. So here, so I have the output. Goes through the fine attenuator. Then goes through the larger switched attenuator. Some of the signal is brought up here. This is the marker amp level control. Well, I believe it's a marker amp level control, marker amp control of some sort. So we have the sweep signal coming in. Is that a variable? What is that? This will be the marker uh, oscillator here. This looks like, what's it doing here? This is the B plus coming in. You're switching the B plus on and off to this half of the tube. The output from here is, is perhaps here. You don't really know exactly what they're doing here. So maybe what they're doing is they're taking the marker frequency and fiddling with the crystal to produce the uh, 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 the products to give you all the different pips. Um, and then they would feed it back out of here. So it goes through the radio. Wow, I don't know, I can't follow it. I can't, it's not coming through. Not coming through! What I really should do is I should go back and look at the signal back here and, and see what's here. And if I wanted to see the output of this, which I've seen because it, 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 it's still working, even though there's none of this anymore, <laughs> there's no sweep signal, this was still no sweep signal. No, I had to be careful how I say that. There's a sweep signal to control the sweep on the scope and then there's the signal sweeping back and forth in the radio. Gotta watch out my language here. So, uh, precise language. Precision in talk, in speech. Precision in speech is absolutely important all the time for us in all of our conversations of any importance. Precision is absolutely required. And the reason is so the people listening to you talk can tell you precisely where you're wrong. It's really important. If you're talking in very general general terms, then someone will talk back to you in those same general terms. And you'll say, you know, airplanes fly high. 
and you'll say, no, they don't. And you'll say, yes, they do. And that's your conversation. It's, it's ridiculous. There's no precision in it. And for sure, you'll never learn that airplanes don't fly high. So anyway, my little speech on precision. Uh, it, it takes like an example of this is when people are being interviewed on TV. So they interview a politician, they interview him for three minutes. There's no precision in that whole interview. You got to interview somebody for like an hour. They have a long format interview, and that's when all the little bits and pieces come out, and what he's saying starts becoming more and more precise. And bits and pieces can be talked about, and maybe the guy's going to learn something. Maybe this bit doesn't actually work right. But when you're dealing with a whole enchilada, it's just not our practice as human beings to throw away the enchilada unless somebody can explain exactly what's wrong with that enchilada. Oh my gosh, so speechy. You know why? Because I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> that's, that's why I've gone off into a safe, protected zone here to talk about something else. Uh, another issue is this 2500 ohm resistor that I found a fair bit of B plus on one side and next to nothing on the other. Why don't we measure the resistance of that? That guy right there just see if it isn't way off. 2500. My new meter has become an old vintage piece of equipment now. Zero. Zero. What? Zero. Uh, let me try, uh, maybe I'm, let me try terminal here. wire goes to this terminal. Zero. Well, that ain't right. <laughs> that can't be right, can it? Zero. How can you get a zero on a resistor? Like that. Something, uh, you know, how do you get 600 ohms with it just leading, leading around here? I'll fix it. Just, let me just repeat that one more time. That's what a zero looks like. <laughs> now we get a reading. 2.4. How was I getting a zero there? How did that happen? Good thing I am so doubtful of myself that I will repeat things over and over and over. I repeat them until I get the number I want. Confirmation bias. <laughs> hey, makes life easy for us. Don't, don't knock conf confirmation bias. Keeps the world simple so we can live our lives. <sighs> okay, so it's 2,500 ohms. It's not a problem. Why such a high voltage drop across it? Exactly, exactly why, I don't know. Maybe there's some problem on the far side of it. So I wanted to find that output spot. Let me put this big schematic back up here. Okay, so I've been sitting on my deck, reading through the manual again. This is like the fourth time through it, but this time I'm absorbing a lot. I'm over the hump here. Some interesting things. On the schematic is this little circuit. Horizontal input to scope. Here's the circuit that drives the, the horizontal movement of, the, of my scope. 
just a little circuit here and it connects into this at points A and B. Oh man, I looked high and low for A and B, A and B, A and B, A and B. It turns out they're over here, right on the power supply transformer because, of course, the horizontal output or the sweep, um, the horizontal output, I better not use the word sweep, um, is uh, derived directly from the 60 cycle power line. And uh, so, uh, so it's not surprising that it's taking it off here. Okay, that's that's an interesting little thing. Secondly, this is an output. This is supposed to be an input, but on mine, it's probably been converted to an output. I'm not sure about that. But the idea here is everything that is going into the antenna of the receiver or into the circuits of the receiver you're you're checking is coming out of this one. This is this is uh, this is this guy here. It's all there. Markers, yeah. sweep frequency, everything is there. The purpose of this is so you can put another signal generator and add another marker pip based on another signal generator input here. So you have the crystal, you have the marker frequency, you have the um, products of mixing the marker the crystal frequency with the marker frequency coming over it gives you the display of pips all across your screen for doing FM work it make a lot of sense if this were a 10.7 crystal if this were a 10.7 crystal then that's really helpful <laughs> I just said the same thing twice two different ways I should be a politician for crying out loud so when I was looking at this earlier, I was kind of seeing the signal going up this way and something happening. No, 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 no. The signal comes out of this to here. At least originally it did. Now, my unit's been altered. And you, can, you, know, you can see it, but this is scratched out. This is scratched out. This has been scratched out. So something different is going on now with this. i got to sort that out, what exactly they're, they're doing. So it should be very surprising if there's no horizontal on the horizontal. Uh, it, it regards of oh, this thing could be all messed up, something horrible. Pull all the tubes out, everything. And you still get the horizontal to the scope. So, uh, so I'm going to go back to this idea now of trying to detect these signals or put them on the scope earlier here instead of out here because out here has this extra 6AU6 tube, which you don't appear in this diagram at all. It's sitting out here with doing stuff. Um, so I'm going to kind of back up and just make sure that this thing is working uh, further on. So an easy place to pick up the signals at this fine attenuator, as I mentioned before. So we're going to do that. And an easy place to pick up the marker signal. I don't know. Well, it would, would be present here, I think. But see, we don't know. We made alterations. We don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Nobody knows. The guy who did this knows. Hey, are you the guy who did this? <laughs> are you watching this video? Seeing your machine get uh, run over by me? Another interesting thing, which I'm not sure what to make of it, is this. So when they drew this diagram, they obviously used a computer or something like that, and it didn't have this kind of shape in it, so that's penciled in. Somebody penciled in this. What is it? You got me. I don't know what it is. I don't know what they're trying to do. I mean, it looks like jumpers, right, that you could disconnect and reconnect. But uh, yeah. What's it jumping over? This also has a schematic in it. I was wrong about it not having a schematic. How's that in the front? Here again are the jumpers, only this time they're drawn a little more professionally. This is identical to the one on the page. So, okay, so I said, I said, let me get this in front of my face here. Keep the schematic out. I said, I should be able to pick up the signal of the, uh, let's start with the main oscillator and its signal. Should be able to get at the top of the attenuator. Actually, get either one at the top of the attenuator. Get either one. Oh, that doesn't make sense. That makes sense. No, I don't think that makes sense. Let's go top of the fine adjustment. 
Okay, fine adjustment. Fine adjustment is here. Oh, easy access. A pretty obvious switch side's grounded here because of a great big braid coming off it. So this is on a big resistor here, three zero with two zeros, three K resistor. Does that fit with this? Let me get some certainty here. Can anybody see a three K resistor in there? Hmm. see one well again things may have been altered here um, because there, 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 there were some changes like that done but where did where did, where did I lost myself where did I go here look you lost lost where I'm at oh, here, uh, <laughs> I'm having a brain uh, uh, yeah I'm having a brain <laughs> Having a brain right now. Put it like that. I just totally lost what I was looking at. How could that be? As I look at this diagram. Oh my gosh, is the coffee not strong enough today? It's this guy here. That's why. The reason I can't see I can't see it when I look down this way. It just disappeared from view. Yes, sorry, okay. And that's right off of this pot here. Fine attenuator. Fine attenuator. This would be the input side. So this is showing a shielded cable coming from up here. There's no shielded cable connected there. So what's happened is this, this is now part of this new circuit. Why those little so we have to go back even further, uh, maybe to uh, pin 3 on the 6BQ7. Pin 3 on the 6BQ7. Where is the 6BQ7? Is that the one that's upside down in there? I think it is. There's no diagrams for that, I don't think. They often don't show which tube goes where in this book. That's something. So, pretty sure this is the 6BQ7. Can't, can't, can't be wrong. 6BQ7, okay. Can't be wrong now. So what I want to do is look at one of the cathodes on this tube. First I need to put it back in. That hat I just took off my head is a dangerous hat. There we go. My wife bought four identical hats for me because I'm forever leaving them and can't find them and that's so why I have four hats like this spread around the house. The problem with these hats, you put them on and they come a little low. They come a little low. The result is I can't I can't see up. I can't see up over top of the brim. The result of that is I bash my head on almost everything when I'm outside. <laughs> I can't see it coming. Dangerous hats. And that probably explains a lot. Bashing my head repeatedly. Probably explains a lot. Now, well, again, I've lost track of what I'm doing. Really? It's because I'm running all around this morning doing all kinds of stuff. So we want, yeah, we have, sorry, pin 6 of the 6BQ7, wasn't it? I was going to go after pin 3. Oh boy, pin 3 of the 6BQ7. Pin 3 of the 6BQ7. Let me put a clip lead on it right away. Okay, it's easy to get to. Pin 3. One, two, three. Three would be this blue wire here. Let me just put my head right in front. Okay, that's 
right. I just want to make Sometimes I'm a little lackadaisical in my observations, and I make a false observation, but I don't, I'm not really careful to make sure I don't do that, and I have a false observation, and then guess what happens after that? Mistakes get made. So I'm looking very carefully here. One, two, three is this blue wire. So I'm just marking it with this clip lead. It's a blue wire. Goodness grief. So this should be a good spot to hook up the oscilloscope to see what's coming out. What's coming out of the marker. So I think that's the primary oscillator there. Yeah, I don't know. Carry on with what we're doing here. I, I, I have a notion of what I'm doing. That's enough. Okay, I'm going to put this right on here so we can't forget it. front panel has no outputs connected except the uh, horizontal uh, drive for the scope which we are going to switch on here we're all set are we all set not plugged in okay so I made a bad mistake from a safety point of view I did not follow my, my standard procedure don't follow the standard procedure an accident can ensue my standard procedure is to plug this into here then I have control with these switches up here, which I can see. I plugged this into a regular outlet for some reason, I can't remember why. I forgot, I had done that. I then looked up at my control panel switches, which are in the neutral position. I mean, no power at this thing. I then looked over at it, and thank God I could see a tube was glowing. Because uh, I was setting myself up for a bit of a uh, surprise there. The non-standard procedure, plugging it in a regular outlet. I don't know. I don't almost never do that, and then forgetting about it. Okay, we're ready to start this guy up now. He is switched off. Okay, so I'll put the power on. I'll switch him on, and see what happens on the O scope. You saw the dim bulb come up briefly. And we're at 100 and 105 volts now. Probably enough. This thing has gone way up there. Isn't that interesting? That's pretty interesting. That is pretty interesting. Let me, uh, Very interesting. I'm just going to raise it up here a little bit. Can I do that? It's a circle. How do you like that? Now we're going to fill with the phasing control here. Horizontal phase. Oh! If you, I don't know if you can hear this, but very quietly, as that diagram flips, there's a clicky sound that comes out of here. But there's nothing in there's no mechanical action going on here. Listen very carefully. Unfortunately, my air conditioner is running, so it's a little noisy in here, but no, 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 no. There was another noise in my shop there. I don't hear a thing. <laughs> Ignore me. So that's kind of weird. I thought if you turn this control, the circle would, would, would kind of change shape and maybe maybe do something. But it seems to just 
pop, pop. Um, but what we really want to look at is this thing as uh, on a time base. So we're going to flip it over to the time base here. Well, that looks interesting. Just a little bit smaller. I'll make a few more on the screen. What do we think we're seeing there? I will vary the frequency here and we'll see. Well, we're not, not seeing anything from that. We're not seeing anything from that. Oh my gosh, this my scope is triggering on the line. That's a line hum. You know, of course it is, of course it is. So I'm looking in the time base at the signal used to sweep the scope when you're using this instrument, and that's derived from the 60 cycle power line. So it's just it's just 60 cycles. So that's the right thing. So at least one one thing is coming out correctly here <laughs> from that little tiny circuit. Okay, so no problem with the sweep on this. So let's go back to X, X, Y. So now that signal you were looking at is the one that's driving it this way. And the vertical is... Uh, so the only way you get a circle like that is the vertical is also getting a 60 cycle thing to it. Why would that be? Um, because I, I picked off the wrong terminal here. It's possible. But, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like it. It does look like it. It looks like I picked the wrong terminal. Good. There we go. I think that's the right terminal. <laughs> or nothing. I think that's the right terminal. Uh, bit of DC there. We're supposed to see something. Maybe it's not sensitive enough. There, so this is suggesting to me now the oscillator is not oscillating, and that would be this one here. We're trying to see nothing happening. What else could be wrong? Big attenuator setting, but we don't know what any of this stuff's doing anymore because that extra circuit that's in there. We don't know what's going on. I picked the wrong spot to do a test, and I'm, I'm just full of baloney. So, so ultimately, both the markers and the uh, fundamental sweep frequency should be present there. Why don't we go back to that and take a look at it? What have I got here? I've got this big long cable to put on. Uh, it recommends you use a properly terminated cable, but we're just fiddling around here. We're not doing any actual work. Okay, so, this should have the. Uh, oscillator output and to get another scope going in here. Okay, we'll take this on. I'm just going to hook it up to the output here. See, one thing I'd never do. See, I'm holding this. I'm holding this. I'm lying about what, I'm, what I'd never do. It would never touch both the metal at the same time with my two separate hands. On purpose, anyway, because who knows? There could be a million volts between there. Just little practices. I'm just sharing with you that things I do. I don't never comment on. They're just constantly doing these things, to, and I'm sure you are too. If you're, uh, of course, you don't want to do that. That's a stupid move. Do something more sensible like that. I just said I'd never touch them both. They just did. <laughs> well, what do we got? We got we got nothing on here still. So let's be a little out of focus on the camera here because it looks looks wider in the camera. It's a nice thin line here. 
wino output. Change pads. Attenuator. Phase adjustment. This is nothing. More sensitive. Times one. It's just nothing at all coming out of it. That is the status. <laughs> uh, hey, the crystal's out. The crystal's out. Now I have a few more crystals. Here it is. So this this crystal has a number on it. Three point no three. This is three megahertz. Three o three seven kilocycles. I have no idea why this one would be in there. Let's put it in and see what happens. And nothing really happens. We don't have the mm, marker amp turned on. Let's turn it on. And turn it up. And we're seeing nothing. There still is something I don't know about this machine here. So this is an external marker input. What's that? I'm gonna find out. Well, it didn't take long. I just had to open up the book to the photograph. There is no such thing. This is another added in thing. But totally fooled. You know, early on I noticed there's no label, but I really didn't think it was, somebody would have added it in because it's the same style as, as this one. But this is an additional thing. That additional circuit that has been built into it may be using that as an output. Look, let's turn the power off here before I do get myself a lift. It's the uh, wires underneath we want to look at. So we see this, which has been installed, now I realize, has a drive cable coming to it from up in this circuit up here. So what's that mean now? You get only the sweep out of here and the markers come out of here. Ah, I managed to confuse the situation here. I don't like that dot sitting there. So, uh, uh, I gotta study some more about what what is going on here. And again, I, I may have no plan for this thing because the guy who did this may have been clever enough to think his own way through and make his own decisions about what he wanted to do with his device for his own sake. He didn't think one iota about me.